straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. Hello again, this is Jay Shapiro. Thanks for listening. There are essentially three topics that I want to touch upon in the program this week. The first is the exodus of Jews from Europe. 200 years ago, the Jewish population of Europe, particularly east of the Rhine River and as far east as the Ural Mountains, was countless millions of people. Between emigration and murder, the Jewish population dropped to a number equal to what it was a thousand years ago. I'll say a few words about that. The next topic is entirely different. It has to do with the fact that one of the policy goals of the Israeli government is to integrate happiness into government policy. That is strange, but worthy of comment. And the most important topic has to do with the fact that if the next American administration is a democratic one, there will undoubtedly be a large change in American policy towards Israel and the Middle East in general and will not be a policy that is favorable towards Israel. The interval of the Trump administration was a singular change in American policy, and the Democratic Party today is very different than the one in 1948 when President Truman recognized the state of Israel within minutes of the declaration of the establishment of the state. The Democratic Party today is radically different and left-wing and based upon statements by major figures of the incoming administration and those who have influence in the party, the policy towards Israel will be hostile and unfriendly. So it appears that the Democratic Party of Harry Truman and John Kennedy is no longer This is unfortunate, but Israel has to prepare itself for what could be a radical change from what we have accustomed to under President Trump. Thanks for listening. I'll be back in a few moments. The return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel was prophesied in the Bible thousands of years ago and is coming true today. Shalom. Join me, Josh Wander, on Israel Unplugged. Listen in as we delve into the spiritual and physical aspects of the Jewish return to Zion. We'll discuss the biblically mandated, historic, and of course practical understandings of this incredible transition from exile to redemption. That's Israel Unplugged every Monday on IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. You're back with Jay Shapiro, one of the most incisive analysts of politics, Israel, United States, and international, is Carolyn Glick. And I want to share with the listeners Uh, Something that I read this week that she uh, wrote about the what she calls the coming storm and U.S.-Israel relations. She noted that the day before the U.S. presidential election, the Israel Democracy Institute published the results of a poll of Israeli Jews asking whether they believed that President Donald Trump or former President Joe, Vice President Joe Biden would be better for Israel. And 70% named Trump better for Israel, 13% chose Biden, and 17% said they didn't know. Now, Biden, his running mate Kamala Harris, 
and his team repeatedly set out his Middle Eastern polities in detail over the course of the campaign. And in the days since it became clear that Biden is far more, far more likely than Trump to be inaugurated in January, his advisors have restated these policies and in some cases have taken initial steps toward implementing them. If statements and actions by Biden, Harris, and their campaign during the course of the election and in its immediate aftermath were not enough to convince Israel's leadership of their depth and commitment, the Democratic Party as a whole stands behind Biden. In the days since elect the election, Democrats, particularly in the House of Representatives, have been playing the blame game regarding the fact that they took losses. Whereas everyone was certain that the Democrats would expand the House majority, it ended up losing 12 seats. So the Democrat majority has moved from comfortable to endangered. And more significantly, moderates now insist that the progressives took the party too far to the left and lost its precious votes in mixed districts. The radicals of the Democratic Party note that nearly everyone who ran with their policies won their races and demand even greater sway in party decision-making and leadership circles. In other words, the Democratic Party is far to the left is not even recognizable, recognizable as the Democratic Party that I grew up knowing. But the infighting between the moderates and the radicals revolves around primarily domestic issues like socialism and defunding the police. These, this infighting has almost nothing to do with Israel or the wider Middle East. Policies on those issues are pretty much consensual between the center of the Democratic Party and the radicals. They are consensual because as statements and action by the campaign, by Biden, by Harris, and by the Democratic National Committee have made clear Biden's policy on Israel, Iran, and the Middle East are essentially the same as the Obama-Biden administration policies. In other words, a Biden-Harris administration Middle East policy will pick up precisely where the Obama-Biden administration left off four years ago. Trump's policies will be annulled, ignored, set aside, or rendered irrelevant. Biden has committed himself to restore the Palestinians to center stage and to reinstate U.S. funding to the Palestinian Authority. In other words, they're going to pay money to the terrorists. There was a Taylor Force Act which barred the United States from funding the Palestinian Authority so, so long as it pays salaries to the terrorists. Trump ended U.S. financial support for the Palestinian Authority because it refused to stop funneling hundreds of millions of dollars to terrorists. Likewise, Palestinian Authority funding of terrorists caused Trump to close the PLO's representative office in Washington, which Biden has committed to reopening. Biden also committed himself to reinstating U.S. humanitarian aid to the Gaza Strip, and such a move will be a boon to the Hamas terrorist regime, which currently relies on cash payments from countries like Qatar. So the, uh, the Obama administration, as far as the Palestinians were concerned, was they, in the very end of the Obama administration, it was UN Security Council Resolution 2234, back in December of 2016. And that resolution was initiated by Obama and his UN ambassador, Samantha Power, and they pushed it, attaching the highest priority to harming Israel as much as possible before they left office. Now, 
that that resolution 2234 was geared towards setting up Israeli leaders and civilians to be prosecuted as war criminals in the International Criminal Court by claiming that Israeli communities in Jerusalem, Judea, and Samaria are illegal. In the words of that resolution, those communities and neighborhoods which are home to more than 700,000 Israelis have no legal validity and constitute a flagrant violation under international law. That was Obama and Biden's position. Meanwhile, President Trump recognized Israel's sovereignty over Jerusalem. And uh, last November, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said that uh, Israeli communities in Judea and Samaria are not illegal. So this was the Trump administration's attitude. A Biden administration will ignore the Pompeo doctrine and the State Department's legal opinion substantiating this position that the Israeli communities are not illegal. So the Biden, Harris, and their advisors have all said they'll reinstate the Obama administration's demand that Israel bar Israeli Jews from asserting their property rights to build homes and communities in Judea and Samaria. As for Jerusalem, while Biden has said he'll not close the U.S. Embassy in Jerusalem and reinstate the embassy in Tel Aviv, Biden has pledged to reopen the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem to serve the Palestinians. Until Trump recognized Jerusalem as Israel's capital, the U.S. consulate in Jerusalem operated independently of the embassy. The U.S. consulate in Jerusalem was not accredited by the Israeli president because the United States refused to acknowledge that Jerusalem is located inside Israel. Now, it, it also, even though Biden congratulated Israel, the United Arab Emirates, and Bahrain, and what they call the Abraham Accords, his advisors, that is, Biden's advisors, have spoken derisively of these agreements between Israel and these Arab countries. Biden's people said that they were not peace deals, but a mere vehicle for those countries, particularly the United Arab Emirates, to acquire American F-35s. The uh, And also, the, but Biden's advisor alleged that the, the United Arab Emirates wants to use the deals to help Saudi Arabia win its war against the Houthis in Yemen, who are backed by Iran. So Biden, Harris, and their advisors have pledged to end U.S. support for Saudi Arabia in that war and to reassess the U.S.-Saudi alliance. So if implemented, these policies will end the U.S.-Saudi alliance. And for the Saudis, the war against the Houthis is not a war of choice, but it's an existential struggle. The Houthis are an Iranian proxy regime. Their control over the Strait of Bab al manda threatens the maritime shipments from the Red Sea. And this is what is happening. Saudi Arabia is in a spot. If the U.S. ends its alliance, the Saudis will continue their war. They have no choice to replace their alliance with the United States with some kind of alliance with a country like China. So the United States, by supporting Iran's policy in, in Yemen uh, against the Saudi Arabia, is not the only way that the Biden administration will help Iran to fight the former allies of Arab allies of the United States and Israel. Biden, Harris, and their campaign advisors have all pledged repeatedly to reinstate the U.S. commitment to the nuclear deal the Obama administration concluded with the Iranians back in 2015 when they gave them all that cash to pay for their losses due to the, uh, the uh, their isolation. So now what's happened is that various reports have uh, emerged saying that Biden is going to lean much back toward the Obama administration policies, policies which cannot be good for Israel. The, 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 it, it's a tough situation, and Israel's going to have to be extremely careful 
if Biden becomes the president, he's a, he's an interesting, he's a personal, a, a jovial person. And however, his party has been taken over by the radicals, and these are the facts. And they're going to, they're going to pose a problem to Israel's national interests. So Israel must steal itself for what it waits in. I'll be back after the break. Hi everyone, this is Andrea Simington from Jerusalem inviting you to drop everything and join me on my show, Pull Up a Chair. We'll visit this week's quirky stories, meet fabulous guests, and discover my Israel. Together we'll laugh, shout, and explain the topics that make us say, hey, we've got to talk about that. So get comfortable and pull up a chair with me, Andrea Simington, every Thursday on Israel News Talk Radio. Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Did you know this psalm and many others were composed by a Jewish shepherd and musician who later became a king? Would you like to know some of the inner meanings of psalms to help you connect with God and strengthen your soul? An exciting and easy to read book is now available, which will help you do just that. Software for the Soul, Psalms for Everyone, available on Kindle, Audible, and Amazon.com. Software for the Soul. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. You're back with Jay Shapiro. In this segment of the program, I want to do what I call under the radar. It's the news about the Jews around the world that you don't see much in the headlines. The first item has to do with what I would call the silent exodus from Europe. Europe's Jewish population now is as low as it was 1,000 years ago, and the future doesn't look very bright. The Jews' share of the population of Europe is they're declining even further now, and it, today it's roughly what it was a thousand years ago, according to a landmark new demographic study. The London-based Institute for Jewish Policy Research, an organization which I never heard of before, apparently it's a serious organization, they found that 1.3 million people who describe themselves as Jewish in continental Europe, the United Kingdom, Turkey, and Russia. That figure has declined by nearly 60% since 1970, when there were 3.2 million Jews in the same area. Now it's 1.3. The uh, That decline which follows the death of 6 million European Jews in the Holocaust, is mostly due to the emigration of more than 1.5 million Jews following the collapse of the Iron Curtain. But Western Europe, too, has lost 8.5% of the Jewish population since 1970, it is home to just over a million Jews today compared to a one and a quarter million Jews in 1970. In particular, the Jewish community of Germany is in a terminal state because more than 40% of its 118,000 Jews are above the age of 65, whereas less than 10% are under 15. Now, this reality, which exists in Russia and Ukraine, more or less foreshadows high death rates and unavoidable future population decline, according to these studies. Now, this project, and I don't want to bore the listeners with numbers, but I just want to tell you about the trends. This project is arguably the most comprehensive survey of Jewish demographics ever completed in Europe. Uh, and that, that's uh, pretty serious. It's based on official census data 
and figures provided by individual Jewish communities, which are often organized with official membership numbers. The proportion of Jews residing in Europe is about the same as it was at the, at the time of the first Jewish global population account, which conducted, was conducted, believe it or not, by Benjamin of Tudela, a Jewish medieval traveler in the year 1170. So today, in 2020, the Jewish population of Europe is roughly the same as it was in 1170. The study also notes that there are an additional 2.8 million people in Europe today who are entitled to immigrate to Israel based on their ancestral Jewish roots. Ancestral Jewish roots means at least one Jewish grandparent, but who are not necessarily Jewish themselves or do not identify as Jewish. Now, obviously, the demographics of European Jewry would have been totally different without the impact of the Holocaust. But that was 75 years ago. And some of the trends we're seeing today, which are driving the decline, have little to do with genocide. So what are the trends that are driving the decrease in the Jewish population in Europe? Well, there's increasing intermarriage and a decline in the reproduction rate of Jewish couples. By, which is, by the way, part of the broader drop in birth rate throughout Europe in recent decades. So Jews in Europe have grown to con- had grown to con- constitute eighty three percent of world Jewry in nineteen hundred eighty three percent. By now they account for merely nine percent of the total number of Jews worldwide. According to this study, think about that. 83% of of world Jewry 120 years ago was in Europe, and now it's 9%. So there are all kind of other Jewish organizations doing research on population, but they they pretty much come out the same. Uh, One one, um, one, uh, membership... um, of the Jewish community survey says there's 1.9 million, another says there's 1.5 million. So uh, there's some arguments, but there's no doubt that the Jewish community in Europe is um, declining. As far as individual countries are concerned, by the way, France, which has the second largest diaspora population after the United States, is responsible for much of the decline in Western Europe. There are 449,000 Jews living in France. It's almost a quarter of a million. I'm sorry, almost a half a million. There were, there were 530,000 in 1970. So in, uh, in 2000 alone, more than 51,000 French Jews moved to Israel by far more than any other Western European nation. Belgium is a very distant second with about 2,500 making Aliyah. So at the current rate of decline, uh, Canada, which is supposed to have 391,000 Jews, will soon overtake France as home of the world's second largest diaspora community behind the United States. Now, the, the, the reason that the French Jewry is uh, declining includes economic opportunity and fear about anti-Semitism. France today is a place where a history teacher can get beheaded on the street. That's something that happened uh, just recently. Uh, the report also shows that Turkey, which used to have about 40,000 Jews in 1970, has only 15,000. That drop is a product of a low reproduction rate and high emigration rate. So there's also a rise of anti-Semitism in Turkey. That's also a factor. Again, I, I my intention here is not to uh, bore the uh, readers with numbers, but give you an idea of what is happening as far as European Jewry is concerned.
There's a couple other interesting uh, items in uh, in the report. The uh, the report's findings on Germany are remarkable because it has seen an influx of about 200,000 Jews from the former Soviet Union when it collapsed in 1990. And that wave, as well as the immigration of about 10,000 Israelis, pretty much revitalized German Jewry. But the newcomers have failed to change the community's demographic trajectory because many of them and their children intermarried, stopped considering themselves Jewish, emigrated, or died. Some of them were old. So there are some exceptions to the picture of decline, and that's interesting, and that is they're occurring in countries where the Jewish community is largely orthodox. For example, the Jewish population of Austria, Belgium, the United Kingdom, and Switzerland, all with sizable, strictly Orthodox communities, may be growing, or at least not declining, according to all these official reports. In Belgium, for example, where more than half of the country's 29,000 Jews are Orthodox, 43% of Jewish households have at least four children. In the Netherlands, where Orthodox Jews may come up a tiny minority of countries, Jewish community, only about 18% of families have that many children. So the Orthodox are, are, are essentially increasing, while the, le- the re- other Jewish communities are just simply getting smaller. The, there's pretty much what they call a si- silent exodus, which is marked by the sale of uh, synagogues and closure of Jewish educational institutions, which is happening particularly in Brussels. So the pretty much we can say that um, some of the Jewish communities were stabilized by having Israelis show up. For example, the Israelis account for 40% of all the Jews in Norway, Finland, and Spain, Denmark, Austria, and the Netherlands. So overall, though, the declining trend reshaping European Jewry is not likely to be reversed, according to the study. So, only under exceptional circumstances do demographic trends radically modify their course. But such modifications have actually occurred more than once in European Jewish demography. So, you can't tell what in the final analysis what's going to happen. So, I I devoted this segment of the program to talking about uh, European Jewry because, uh, interestingly enough, when I was raised in the United States, most of the, of the Jews had European backgrounds. As a matter of fact, I never met a Bulgarian Jew until I came to Israel 50 years ago. So I just wanted to give the uh, listeners an idea of what's happening. There is a silent exodus from Europe, and interestingly enough, it's as low as it was a thousand years ago. So uh, <laughs> you, you can't predict what's going to happen to Jews. I'll be back after the break. Are you interested in transforming your life, drawing closer to the Creator, and uncovering the deeper meanings and hidden treasures in the Hebrew Bible? Then join me, Rav Yitzhak Michelson, and me, William Hall, on the Science of Kabbalah, where we are seeking to narrow the gap between what we understand of our physical and spiritual worlds. So make sure to tune in every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Israel Time, 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, here on Israel News Talk Radio. You're listening to The Jay Shapiro Show. You're back with Jay Shapiro, and I want to do a couple more items that are under the radar because I think they are of interest and are the kind of things that I think the listeners will find in the headlines anywhere. The first item has to do with the United Arab Emirates, and you know Israel has signed an agreement 
with the United Arab Emirates, with Bahrain, and now with Sudan. The first one was with the UAE. Now, believe it or not, the United Arab Emirates has a Minister of State for Happiness and Well-Being. Now, they're, they're going to normalize ties with Israel, and that should not have come that much as a surprise. Why not? Because a minister for happiness bespeaks of a government that is concerned for the happiness, the well-being, and quality of life of its citizens. And love Israel or hate it, there is no denying that this country has what to offer to other countries in terms of quality of life and well-being. Now, there are studies being done at Bar Ilan University where they're writing a thesis on how happiness has become a policy goal. Israel has what to learn from the UAE, particularly the desirability of integrating people's happiness into government policy decisions. This really is novel. It came as a surprise to me. Because making the happiness a factor in government decisions is one of the tasks of the United Arab Emirates Happiness Minister. There's a happiness minister, it's a woman. Uh, her name's not important, you, the listeners won't remember it. The idea is that if the government is going to build homes and say should build them in places that will make people happy, if it is going to promote job development and look toward those jobs that bring happiness, let people's happiness be a key element in making government choices. That's, that seems to me to be a rather novel approach, and I never heard of anything like that before, but it certainly is of interest. Make government decisions that will make people happy. So th this, uh, that is what this minister of uh, happiness, uh, I guess, I, I don't know what they call in Arabic, I guess it's the happiness minister, so trying to measure happiness and providing uh, happiness as tools to decision makers it seems to be gaining traction in the scientific community. One good example of this is the annual World Happiness Survey, which ranks 156 countries according to their happiness. For example, the United Kingdom was ranked 19th in a 2017 survey, and in 2018, as a result of this, it appointed, believe me, this is a, a, this is a mouthful, it's the, the United Kingdom appointed a minister for loneliness. The UAE has a minister for happiness, and the United Kingdom has a minister for loneliness to try and ease what was increasingly seen as a public health problem in Britain. In 2020, the United Kingdom jumped to 13th in the happiness rankings, and that put them one spot ahead of Israel. So they are happier in the United Kingdom than they are in Israel. Now, Israel ranked 11th in the 2018 survey, and it dropped the 14th in 2020 survey. But 14 out of 156 is still very respectable. It is also counterintuitive to those looking in from the outside who see Israel only through the prism of conflict and security challenges. So Israel's pretty high on the happiness ranking. And the United Arab Emirates is the highest ranking Arab country on the list. It follows Israel, Israel by seven spots. Israel's in the 14th, and the UAE is in the 21st. So it could be that if the survey is taken this year as well, it's likely that the COVID-19 pandemic will have taken a bite out of the sense of satisfaction many in Israel feel with their lives. It will probably do the same throughout the world, so our country's overall ranking will likely remain the same. The, uh, 
But if you understand what is measured and how they measure it and what is folded into it, you can understand why we are at such a high level. Because the measurement of happiness, the metrics are a mix of the objective and the subjective. The objective includes measurements as gross, gross uh, GDP, life expectancy, and there are subjective measures including life satisfaction, perception of corruption in one's country. So, in, in, <laughs> the consideration of corrupt, corruption is of interest. For the, um, for the decisions are Corruption implies that decisions are not made for the benefit of the public. So it's pretty much important to personal happiness. In the World Happiness Surveys, Israel consistently scores high on the life satisfaction question. And this apparently has to do with a sense of purpose and meaning in our lives. Many people have living here coupled with being close to loved ones and friends. So apparently having an objective in life, having uh, something to live for, a sense of purpose affects your uh, how happy you are. So the, question, the satisfaction of life is an evalu evaluative one. How do you evaluate, how do you evaluate your life? So what about emotions? The emotion question is how you experience your life. You can ask a question like, uh, did you experience sadness, anger, or other negative emotions in the last year? And then you can ask if you experienced joy, hope, and a variety of positive emotions. And then they give a ratio. The negative emotions in Israel are usually higher than the positive ones, but this is more than balanced out by a feeling of purpose and meaning in life. That's very interesting. Did a a um, the, the people who do these surveys say that a feeling of purpose and meaning in life makes up for a lot of negative emotions? So, in the sense of purpose, we're very high. I guess we're, I think we're also high in negative emotions, and that would explain how Israel's perceived in these studies a happy country, even though anyone who lives here knows about the constant complaining, all of which goes to show that one can complain and still feel life has meaning. Complaining is like the one of the practical, one of the indoor and outdoor sports in Israel. But I think complaining means that you're interested in what's happening about you. You're not indifferent. So, uh, so it could well be the uh, people are worried in the, about their everyday life, what to do with their children uh, and how to take care of parents. But Israel, Israelis are very resilient and very hopeful. If you ask people, I think they'll say they currently have a lot of negative feelings because of the pandemic. But if you ask if they're hopeful, I think they'll say they are. That's a strong feature of Israelis, hope. Because Israelis have experienced so many wars and so much terrorism, hardship, and economic ups and downs, Israelis are very resilient. It makes them more hopeful. There's no part that thinks we're not going to get over this. In other words, we get into despair, but we have hope. So the... Uh, I, I, I'm not sure how this discipline of measuring happiness is relatively new. The idea that happiness is one of man's basic rights goes back at least as far as the U.S. Declaration of Independence. The U.S. Declaration of Independence said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. All men are created equal and that they are endowed by their creator with certain inalienable rights. Among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. You know, we're taught that in school. So it seems that being happy is seen by many as a basic right. doesn't mean you're jumping around dancing on the table and whistling. It means that you look forward, that your basic needs are met, you have social contact, I know whom to trust, I know the government works for me. I think that's really important in Israel. It's, uh, you know, we complain all the time, but we're very high on the happiness list. So the very fact that we're high on the happiness list makes me happy. I think pretty much 
Israelis trust the government, particularly in times of distress. We pay a huge amount of taxes, but apparently we feel they're getting things back. But we don't feel we're getting, some people in a country where you pay a lot of taxes, you don't feel you're getting much back, then you're going to be unhappy. I think living in Israel gives you a sense of purpose. It's really important. That's a subject unto itself. But the very fact that living in a country, which perhaps is one is surrounded by enemies and so forth, gives you a feeling of importance. That's why people run to join the army. So, so the overall national feeling, if you if you feel your that you're part of, of a project, a national project that's important, I think that will contribute to your happiness. At least, I, I like to think so. The bottom line is, I think, that having a sense of purpose can make you happy. That's what keeps Israelis happy. Till next time, Jay Shapiro signing off. If you love Israel News Talk Radio, then you'll love our Facebook page. We keep you up to date on what's happening in Israel, plus little surprise treasures that we don't share on the radio. Go now to follow us on Facebook. Just look for the Israel News Talk Radio Facebook page. And don't forget to subscribe and follow us by clicking on the like button. We post great stuff there that you'll want to share. Israel News Talk Radio on Facebook and Israel News Radio on Twitter. If you're hearing this message, everyone else can too. Advertise with Israel News Talk Radio and get your message out to people. We'll build a personalized package for you. Contact advertising at IsraelNewsTalkRadio.com. Straight talk from Israel. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. Hey, this is Jake in Anchorage, Alaska, and I love listening to all the super interesting interviews and up-to-date information on what's happening in Israel. Hello, this is Anna King, originally from London, now living in Israel. And what can I say? Israel News Talk Radio is my cup of tea. My name is Bhaskar. I'm from India, and I love listening because you get to know the truth and wonderful voices from this lovely country. Mom! Okay, wait a minute. Hi, this is Chava Dax, and I'm calling for the rolling hills of Malaya Dumim, just north of Jerusalem. I always listen to Israel News Talk Radio to get all the latest news and commentary and to keep me up to date every day. This is Sarah Dax from Malaya Dumim, and I'm 12. I wish Israel News Talk Radio was boring so my mom wouldn't listen to it all the time. Mom! You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio. News, opinion, and more. You're listening to Israel News Talk Radio.